only do, not the only one doing um, something, you know, uh, or let's say there's no group that I think will do complete things completely uniquely, right? So there are various groups, for example, dealing with Discord, various groups with other cloud services. Uh, one group has observed already limitations of OpenStack slash GitHub configuration with respect to the uh, webhook invocation, which is really undesirable. Hopefully it's fixed soon. Um, so, so those kind of things. There's also in as much best practices as it's much as it's also about sharing um, ideas that you that you probably um, have. Um, yeah. Oh, Jung Gunnar, you raised your hand. Please speak up. Or yeah. Uh, so Oops, I don't hear you. Hang on, I need to figure things out here. Press button, yeah, that's probably. important. Can you speak again? I can speak again. Do you hear me? It's going through my earphones, I believe. I'll redirect you via the... Now you hear you. Sorry for that. Please. Have I been redirected? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, hang, on. hang on. Yeah, uh, I just, uh, just wanted to... Here's the thing. I have um, this thing called pastoral care. I'm responsible for public health as well. So if students leave this room without the ability to hear afterwards, that's a bit of a risk factor. So, uh, but now I think I moderated you to an extent that we can survive that all. Um, please. Right, so you can hear me at the reasonable levels of decibels. Perfectly fine now, I think. Object. Good. Yeah. Um, just want to quickly run by the course question that got posted to the issue tracker yesterday about when the deadlines actually are because there seems ah, yeah. to be a bit of confusion between what's happening on the 10th and what is happening on the 15th so, yeah, yeah yeah so let's shift it to 15th works for me um like in terms of deadlines for the actual submissible so anyone who feels tiebreaker inclined to submit on the 10th be my guest but anyone who feels like they do better with 15th given that people are stressed by workload levels across courses and across degrees um 15th would work for me as well yeah so if uh, I mean, no one would say no to that, I think I find it. I'm terribly I'm personally not a fan of extending deadlines. The reason is mostly that it's discouraging for students who have actually been done good time management. Right. So uh, and that in work life is not happening either. So generally yeah, a deadline, you better meet it. Right. But again, uh, there, you know, I need to bend, unfortunately, to uh, um, the um, forum, you know, and uh, the, the, the pressures that have been voiced with respect to this semester and the diverse causes. So I'll do. Um, but don't misread this as an idea that uh, deadlines should generally be extended. I think it's not a good practice in principle. Um, and yeah, anyway, 15th is fine for me. So uh, that probably resonates well with the class, I said, sense. No one says no. And uh, not hearing anything means acknowledged, yes, okay, as opposed to, are you kidding me? Um, so I'll take this as a yes. So, okay, 15th it is. I'll, uh, I'll update this on the. Um, the wiki uh the wiki that's right yes at the bar afterwards yep okay cool thanks for bringing this up uh, young um, yeah uh, no issues I, I think i might have to jump off this session early today by the way sure 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 um yeah how are you see fit in fact that's interesting because that's literally the first time that anyone spoke up throughout this entire course via zoom hence my um, you know, surprising. Uh, uh, first of all, surprised that it actually works. Uh, second of all, that it was slightly too loud. Anyway, um, so good to know. So it's good to primer for the presentation on Wednesday because I think half of it, if not more, will probably be held remotely, given that our my beloved what is it nine students are here today. Eight it is are here. So I sense that the majority is online somewhere. Let's hope it uh, they are. Okay, cool. Thanks, Yongina. Appreciate it. Okay, so since we are. Uh, if you have other questions on, just post them in the chat. I'll uh, uh, respond in the break. So, uh, but one other aspect, since we have this, uh, yeah, effectively last kind of mainstream session that is content laden session that I can bombard you with new concepts that I can ask you in the exam, hint, uh, then I need to use this, I guess, wisely. So and that's my intent today as well. Um, so, <laughs> But I, I will not make it particularly change in any way, but it's more like I call this the awareness session, because most of the time we spend, uh, you know, fo we focus a lot about, as far as I'm concerned, in any case, a lot on technology. And doesn't surprise me. Guess what? You're studying at NTNU, which is the Norwegian University of Science, and ah, hang on, technology, right? So there's that thing. Uh, but you're also at a university, on the other hand, which also means you need to kind of have a bit of a uh, conceptual thinking, um, um, uh, you know, um, um, perspective um, kind of they needs to be reinforced to some extent, but also, uh, you know, you may choose in the future as uh, professionals, 
as you are all uh, in, in part already are, or in any case becoming later after your bachelor, uh, you know, be in a position to make decisions, right? So it's not only that you're coding something or you get given a project, get given a spec. Sure, you need to work within existing environments, but eventually you'll be in a position to be perhaps a group leader or, uh, you know, run a, um, or perhaps be a product owner, right? For someone else who knows. Um, or, you know, run teams and so on. So um, I think it's worthwhile to uh, bear in mind that uh, technical decisions are not, you know, narrowly focused only on, uh, you know, knowing the latest state of the art, but also think about a bit of surrounding. And that's the spirit of this uh, session. It's not so much teaching you about, you know, other specifics, but rather about the aspects that you need to bear in mind uh, as a professional when it comes to cloud services and, you know, the kind of mind shape say, set change you need to undergo as part of it. So to this end, I'm talking a bit, even though, you know, I would have had more time for some of those sessions, but, you know, given the reduction of the course lengths to some extent, um, uh, there's, there's this limitation as well, but also the you know, fact that I want to, don't want to produce conceptual overload. I will talk a bit about the economics or, you know, aspects related, like, uh, or put it this way, non-technical aspects of cloud technology. Probably semi-technical aspects because we still talk about tech as well. Uh, but um, I think that's quite important that you also think about the bigger picture. What does it mean if we, for example, make the call to shift everything into the cloud? Right? We have talked about cool virtualization, cool storage, processing, and networking sorted for us. You know, we're offloading it, scripting everything. How beautiful can it be? Sure, there's this technical dimension that makes things easier, flexible, scalable, and adaptive to demands. But the economic perspective that comes with it is also non-eligible. So. In fact, what I think is that um, when you think about uh, sorry, cloud technologies in particular, possibly sometimes in practice, it's more about a shift in thinking than it is about uh, you know, a substantive technological change. Because you can still develop Golang-based services that are non-cloud services, right? So you, you will, your, the programming language skills that you take from here, or you can Dockerize in your, on your own server. No one would keep you from this. It's very convenient. In fact, for your own home use, you can Dockerize your IDE if you wanted to, right? Why not? I mean, it makes it easy. You can decompose, uh, you, can, you can isolate, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of opportunities to do that. I mentioned before, for example, even for my private services that I run something on my machine, I just Dockerize them because it's so convenient. So, um, so it's the, all the tech that we talked about doesn't necessarily have to happen in the cloud, but there are certain aspects that drive us through the cloud. And if they do, we need to consider other aspects as well that, you know, uh, we have talked about it to some extent, we talk about scalability, but today I want to lend a bit more perspective on, you know, uh, economic slash legal aspects that are also relevant um, when we talk about this. And um, there's two scales of concern, as I would refer to them, uh, that come to mind. Uh, one of them is more on the operational side and the other one more on the strategic side. Uh, operational means basically, what are the decisions that- Did you show the screen? Oops, I probably should, huh? I'm not a nice person. Thank you. So um, I'll share the screen. So there are two dimensions that I, one of which I would tag um, as um, strategic, the other one operational, and operational being something that you probably more, now you should see it, um, that you will probably have more practical um, you know, interaction with. And the other one which is more about thinking that is relevant from a business perspective. So if you would, for example, uh, think about running your own company or be involved with or at least get an appreciation of the aspects that uh, come to mind but nevertheless even though we talk a bit about those uh, dimensions i will always keep it you know from a perspective of a developer not not compliance or legal or whatever else because that would be completely unauthoritative because i'm not uh, you know i don't have that background myself but it's just uh, that it becomes quite relevant to think about those aspects so to, to kind of start this up, uh, what are SLAs actually? What does it stand for anyway? Nice exam question. Oh, that's a cheap one. Let's uh, get that one for free. But what is an SLA? Anyone, please. There's something in the chat. Yes, service license agreement. OK, cool. Yeah. What does that roughly do? service level agreements, right? Technically, so what do they, what should they cover? What, are, what, what do, I, do I need to know about those things? SLAs, are you kidding me? Seriously, I know Docker already. Why do I need to know SLA now as well, right? So come on. what should they cover? What are they for? Has anyone had an opportunity to deal with this? 
yeah, there's some feedback. Outline responsibilities in terms of response time. Yeah, from online. Yeah, does it make sense? Who has dealt with an SLA actually? Yeah, perhaps in the room or online. No? I guess what you have, but you just didn't look at it, right? It's what you consider terms and conditions. That's the thing where you scroll to the bottom, say, I agree very quickly. You can do it in your sleep, I think, most of you. But now you don't even know it's about the cookies or actually about the service level agreement that has become very blurred, the boundary there. No, jokes aside, um, exactly. So um, there's another comment uh, referred to a distribution. So uh, yeah, distribution in any case, but of what? I mean, uh, you know, it could be multiple things uh, such as responsive distribution of responsibilities, um, possibly distribution of rewards. I'm not sure if that's intended. So um, yeah, something about distribution. Um, and uh, yeah, there's one comment there. Uh, it's experience, of course, at work. Uptime is a key thing. Ah, okay. Distribution in that they distribute the software to others. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, you can consider the deployment, for example, or uh, uh, service delivery. Yeah, that's definitely one uh, dimension as well. And who are the stakeholders generally involved here? In the context of cloud, more specifically, or more generally, if you like, who are the stakeholders? Who writes service level agreements? Hint, perhaps you in the future, but I'm not sure if that's of help. But please, any. Yeah, that's right. So that's uh, the responsible, the company organization, in the widest sense, the corporate entity uh, associated with the service, right? I guess what? If you provide a cloud service, you kind of need to provide a service level agreement. At least you want to charge for that. In fact, I'm not even quite sure, even if you don't charge for it, you may probably still need to provide a service level agreement just to give a uh, you have, you know, uh, be not liable for any possible uh, mishaps that can go happen along the way. So, um, yeah. So anyone who provides that service and uh, who would possibly sign it, well, any user, right? Corresponding. That's just to set the baseline here. And uh, most of the points that were actually made were quite good. So it's about something about uh, what what is the service content, like distribution, for example, if they are meant to distribute software, content delivery networks, for example. Um, then there was the notion of uptime. There was the responsibility idea. Any, any any other thoughts? That's excitement, right? Those topics are brilliant. Everyone needs to know those. Ah, I know those. Yeah, you know, guys, I sneak that subtly in else I don't have anything for the exam dev. So, uh, but no, that's not really the point. But I think it's also about awareness. So I'm not here so much to necessarily tell you you know what 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 is in there but rather what should be in there and how it's specified because you are have all a bit of a technical background and technical thinking what you should be interested in is specificity it's very easy to have legal text that no one understands but everyone thinks they do but uh, it's more important to have legal text that you guys understand and want to sign or um, see what's happening and there's a set of criteria that are actually very old they are old i think that's yeah before before yeah, before uh, everything happened, before cloud happened in any case. So service level agreement in their in original form, it's kind of a bit more of a, uh, a yeah, legalistic stance. But what is it about? Well, you know, any service level agreement should have a reference to, um, you know, context, the service, guess what? <laughs> you know, AWS better writes what service it should uh, apply to, but also be about clear about terminology, what things mean. And they're usually written in the beginning in a form that's referenced in the definition sections or even in the preamble, which is like the first part of a legal document in general. And uh, they define certain things. And the terminology is, of course, specific to the context. So examples are, what does downtime actually mean? We get back to that in a, in a second. It's actually slightly less clear than it intuitively may think to you. Second of all, what is the code red? Right? So code red is the worst possible emergency, basically, where things need to happen right, right now. That's the worst possible case uh, of, of demand for responsiveness that a company possibly has, right? So it's not just, oh, there's a warning sign, what should we do with this? That means, no, 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 production stop, right? I'm losing thousands of krona every minute here, right? So that's the worst case. It needs to be defined if you have a service level agreement. Mind you, uh, I need to, I'm just calling out the factors that should be defined, uh, but also that are defined when they're customized to a particular customer, client, right? In some instances, you don't have this option. If you go to AWS and say, I want a customized agreement, right? So an EC2 is 
right, right tailored to my needs as, um, you know, I don't know, name, name a small company in your big, right? So, uh, or any sort of consultancy country, you know, next gen incorporated, uh, situated in your big, um, next to CC, right to the left there, but you AWS, please customize uh, my service level agreement. And they will say, uh, what? <laughs> so it's not happening, right? So you will not always have this opportunity to get this alignment that you have a shared understanding, but let's assume you do. The second aspect is, so after uh, defining terminology, so that you're clear about it, is to think about um, uh, metrics. Things should be measurable, right? There should not be best effort. It's the worst possible thing. If you read best effort anywhere, you know, you kind of try not to sign that thing. I mean, unless it's really, I, I don't know, it's completely separate. Best effort is just, it, it's not legally binding. So that's the thing, right? So it basically means, yeah, we, we are intend to, we do our best. But you know, then there's, there was the night in between the next day you've forgotten what that actually meant. So um, best effort is not good enough. So you want to think about what are service times, right? When are you offered support? 24 seven, eight to five, eight to three, not in July because it's holiday. I don't know, right? So you need to think about this very explicitly. You can't just say, oh, we provide service between eight to five. Yeah, but on which weekdays or where, you know, where are your possible exception times? What are surcharges for nighttime interventions? Do you offer nighttime responses even on exception base in the first place? Meaning, you know, is it strictly nine to five, but if something fails at 8 p.m. in the evening, you need to wait until next morning until anything happens or can you pay and then get, you know, never less sort of service as an exceptional charge for, and so on. And the second of what are, that's my favorite one, penalties, come back to that. In practice, I'll put it this way. I think we're in, uh, we, we, we are living in a, we are very blessed where we are here right now, right? So that things work the way they work. But in uh, many instances, to enforce things, you kind of need to penalize people, right? So it needs to hurt to some extent. If you don't satisfy your service agreement between, you know, eight to five or even thereafter and so on, uh, and says, yeah, I tried my best. I kind of didn't work out, you know, plus I, you know, I had Corona or whatever. I, so like, you know, there, there is a lot of flexibility there. Then you need to say, no, no, no. What, what's the, what's the penalty that's associated for you not organizing your, or you're holding up your piece of the service level agreement, right? On the, uh, on the server side. So penalties need to be associated with violations. Very clear, very important. Often not really clear or not really done or done in separate sections. Can also be, but the reference needs to be clear. Which penalty corresponds to which breach of, of the terms, if you want. Right? Second one is um, responsibility. I was mentioned here in the chat, and that's absolutely right. Assignable. Who is, who is uh, responsible, right? Who is doing what? And often boils down to, uh, well, everyone has its part to play, right? It's not always the provider trying to need to fix things. The provider may actually put into your term conditions that you need to provide, based on a template often, um, a distinctive characterization of what went wrong, right? So they actually say, we only act when we get a proper report. Oh, really? Took me two hours to write this. And afterwards you get within five minutes the solution, brilliant. So, uh, but it needs to be clear. What are the expectations, right? What do you need to provide? Can you expect them to monitor your systems and fix it automatically? Or do you need to notify it, right? You have a late light out, you only uh, realize at three in the morning, damn, my service didn't run for five hours, right? So who was responsible for figuring this out and dealing with this, was it me? Or was it actually a company who should have you know, brought it back up already, right? This is an understanding that's oftentimes also missed because it may well be that you intentionally brought your service down for whatever reason, maintenance, develop, upgrade, you know, but then the service provider who is, you know, possibly intervening uh, or should intervene, you know, may not care because you didn't notify it at all, right? So uh, you have this, for example, classically for alarm systems where you say, what are times during which you need to attend to alarms and the times you don't need to? Uh, because, for instance, like if you have companies running at weekdays, that may well be that the owner, you know, uh, 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 leaves overly late or visits uh, in the evening again, but only on weekend you want to have extended support and not expect anyone to ever disable your alarm system, or whatever. There was always a fuss uh, about the conditions related to that, or you need to, you know, explicitly call up in advance, saying, "I'm going to my own office. Please don't, you know, lodge a police alarm because just because my alarm or my 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 system is." Um, disabled or whatever else. So it's very important to think about this uh, aspect as well. What are the responsibilities that come, um, you know, with any action or interaction? Yeah, it needs to be realistic, right? So it's good and nice and shiny to have this really completely unrealistic uh, uh, values, but you need to bear in mind, uh, this is actually framed in, in the context also of physical um, interaction there. So the idea is like, you know, if you need to drive somewhere to a remote location, let's say, 
you are um, servicing a power plant, the thing about power plants is they're usually not on the internet, and that's usually a good idea. So it also means usually that they are not easy, uh, as easily remotely maintainable. I mean, it's also not quite true because there are ways, of course, but let's assume they are not or other kind of facilities. You need to drive there. So point is your response time also needs to be somewhat reasonable, right? So that is un, would be unrealistic. But let's say in the context that we are likely working in, right, you guys, uh, it's probably feasible to have, you know, pretty much a standard response time because likely you're getting into something via VPM or other well-defined means. Of course, the means of access need to also be well-defined as part of it, right? Do you get keys? Do you get VPN access? Do you, you know, so uh, how is it happening? And then we get to the ugly one, that's response time. Within which time frame do you actually need to do something? Uh, you know, what's the uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, um, response that you're generally expecting? Uh, you know, and uh, for example, you know, following the notification of service downtime, you must respond within three minutes or something like this. So what does response then mean? Ah, should be defined here. Does response mean say, yeah, yeah, cool, I got the email, see you tomorrow. Or does response mean actual intervention, logging into a system, solving the issue, attempting to solve the issue? Or what does it, you know, so that needs to be really, really clear. What are the hard boundaries and soft boundaries and what kind of level of interaction do you expect? I mean, just receiving that you have an issue uh, uh, lodged in the you know issue tracker of the service provider is probably not not enough. Comment. Um, that's right. There seems that's a good point. If there are malware attacks, for example, you kind of don't want remote access. You kind of want to do it on premise and cut off everything that's remotely internet-y. Uh, that's right. You want to take the system offline if you can. And uh, that's right. So in this instance, you wouldn't get around actually having a, uh, a physical access. Uh, irrespective of, of, of uh, you know, the nature of the business. That's right. So a very good point uh, in any case. Plus also, you know, internet outage is a thing, right? So we need to be in mind that we can't always ignore it. So, um, and the, the other thing is there um, that I just wanted to uh, highlight here, um, reviews and penalties. What does that mean? Well, I talk about penalties, can't often talk often about, uh, about them often enough. Needs to be clear what happens if things don't happen the way you expect them. Happens with any legal code, should happen in any contract. And service level agreements are formally contracts. So, um, and then there's the review element. So it basically means how long is the contract binding, right? So I mean, you know, what happens if you're you're spinning up five other services? Can you change the contract? Can you extend it to those services? Do you need to make a new agreement? Can you amend the agreement? Can you easily include and extend the service level? So there's that flexibility component. If you say you can only review the service level agreement every five years, uh, like uh, no, right? So maybe best agreement on the planet. But that's just not a condition that holds anymore, right? So every few, you know, every year, that's also probably not enough. For some instances, it may be enough. Again, power plant probably. But for you know, an agile business that is kind of start up here and kind of uh, wants to you know try out things, probably not a good idea, right? So it needs to be also that review and that needs to happen together with the service level provider so that everyone is on the same page because it requires review of all that. You can't do that alone. Not just one side looks at it and then we'll see if we are uneasy about it, as opposed to going through it again thoroughly again. So um, very important uh, aspect there. Old principles, but I think super important for, for everyone to think about and uh, know about. It's the so-called smart criteria that often reference in the book. So um, penalties, yeah, penalties need to be un unambiguous. I want to show you two examples. Ah, guess what? Who would have guessed? Uh, Amazon and Google come to mind, of course, because they, of course, have this, right? How do penalties look like? Let's let's look at one. Well, let me just. Uh... This is the Google one. Uh, so here's a basic serverless server agreement for uh, the compute engine in particular. So it's the compute engine only. Google has a lot. I'll show you later the overview. But Google has a lot of server level agreement. They're all different for different services or groups of services, and that's they do that because they face them in and out independently, right? And some of them have higher service levels, so more availability, more more rigidly monitored, and others less so. They're more like beta style, and people uh, sorry, Google doesn't want to commit. They basically say, yeah, use that thing. Good luck. Here's what we kind of intend to offer, and you know, if you don't like it, go away. As opposed to please use our compute service because that's rock solid and you know here's the here here are the conditions right so so they for example provide information about the expected uptime uh, that we have right so this is the expectation in hard metrics what's the uptime for for instance per month we get back to that in a second because that's not the point I want to make my point is more like 
based on those expectations, what happens if you, so you see that they define everything, right? So downtime means virtual machine loss of connectivity and so on uh, for load balancing. And then the exclusion, of course, we talk about exclusion in a bit as well. But here's the point I want to get it. If you are receiving uptime that's lower than 99.99%, for example, per month in Google, you get a 10% uh, um, uh, um, return or basically it's credited to your future bills, basically, right? So here's the penalty uh, quite clearly defined. So if they don't meet the end of the bargain, guess what? You get, you know, something onto your virtual account. Not a big deal there necessarily, but nevertheless, that's actually good to know that, you know, under which condition it happens as well. So that's an example where it's actually properly uh, defined and very clearly where, where the boundaries are and the cutoffs, right? If you really go below 95% availability, it means you get 100% of your money. You run, your service runs for free. We get back to that, what that means in practice uh, a, a bit. But you see, actually, it uh, increases quite significantly um, and relatively quickly. So Amazon does the same. They also have this kind of discount scheme, basically, that they charge you back. They don't give you money, but they put it back into your billing, uh, into your into your account, basically, um, and that you can use for future services and any other services. So it's actually quite neat, quite a neat arrangement. I don't know. Um, uh, unless you, of course, decide to leave the service entirely based on that experience. Um, yeah. Okay. But get back to it. Let's get back. Uh, so that's the penalty side of things. But let's get back to a bit to uh, some, some metrics that I want to be uh, really hard and fast about uh, as well, because I talk about metrics. But things like could reference to different aspects. For example, response time is always specified as maximum time, never minimum time. On average, we respond within one minute. Yeah, good luck. Across what? Across all customers, all incidents and lifetime I have, or whatever. Else. Maximum, right? What's the maximum response time that you know I, I can you know, afford myself? Because that means it can be broken down and assessed on the basis of an individual instance of an issue, right? Not across a number of issues. Uh, that's the main point. So it could be something like this, right? For ninety percent, that's already weak. But anyway, let's say I'm making it up here. For ninety percent of users, response time uh, less than five minutes within a time frame of that. You know a clock so that's clear and you know bad luck after 5 p.m you know look for someone else right so not no, not happening or 24 7 right so or for 100 percent of users and so on um though they're built oftentimes this for 90 percent of users in because they may not if they have a complete outage of all systems they may be challenged to kind of uh, uh service this but that, that's a generally good premise generally it should be about that's the reaction time that you can expect other aspects are such as um guarantees about performance right very common as well it's good enough to know that you have you know a flat rate uh, of mobile internet and so on if you don't know what the performance actually is right so if it's trickling in so you can't even read your uh, 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 let alone watching in our core uh, mobile but certainly not even uh, read the news or uh, VP or whatever else uh, then it doesn't help you that you have a principal arbitrary uh, you know um, arbitrary um, uh, uh, you know um, volume, basically, your credit, if you like, if it's terribly slow. So uh, things like this need to be specified as well, right? So if you have a particular group of files or size of files for clusters, then you should have certain guarantees on it. It also doesn't help you that if, if performance only high for files smaller than 100 megabyte, but drop off with the larger than 100, 1 gigabyte. So there are those positions as well that are sometimes really react specifically to your need. So you real you should see already there's oftentimes a space for customizability and this is actually a reason or the way of how aws and google make money the service are not they don't generally have you know one single and uniform service level but they actually stratified in this kind of in, in those kind of ideas so you need to think about your usage pattern and see what kind of subscription makes most sense for example in with google you can sign up to either uh, book a particular machine vm for a year in advance or simply, uh, you know, as an on-spot instance, and that makes a huge difference in terms of pricing. You get massive discounts for, you know, a longer lease and uh, less, of course, for the spontaneous. Oh no, so less so for a spontaneous instantiation of the in engine uh, of a VM. But you can get massive discounts on AWS for spot engines. So I get back to that in a second as well. So. Uh, it's important to bear in mind what is your usage pattern. So, in as much as it is about knowing your application, developing the code, and knowing it, you want to know its uh, its its behavior. Right? Super important to monitor your own behavior. Then you get the best price out of it because you can see uh, what what service you want and what kind of profiles of 
billing subscriptions and so on you want in those services as well. Many of the providers have things like, uh, like the tools that support you in this process already. But that's actually their business model. That's how they kind of get you in a way, because if you just bluntly sign up, yeah, cool, VM works for me, ah, functions, cool, sounds good. And you run this without further customization, especially of the billing options, you may actually run at a suboptimal uh, level there. The other aspect is um, numbers, for example, utilization levels, right? Can you afford that the shared host that you're operating uh, on or running your services on actually running at a particular high utilization, right? So what's the, what's the kind of uh, levels that you uh, would want to see? So you have, um, you, you can plan for peak performance as well. So um, that's something that some providers offer guarantees on as well. AWS and Google, certainly not. Uh, at least not as I'm aware, you need to be a really big customer before you can actually ask uh, serious questions there. But for smaller providers, that may be sensible, especially if they have uh, more limited um, resources. Um, again, yes, um, that's the other point. Help deck, that's response. I talked about response time, that's one thing. Response time is more uh, relevant when you have an incident, right? When something goes wrong, right? You have code green, code yellow, code orange, code red, usually stratified in those, those ways. Um, but help desk response is something different in the sense that you need support, right? So it's more like you, uh, oh, how do I configure this? How do I set this up? You know, oh, this doesn't work as I wanted to. We need to have this new instance. Can you, uh, you know, integrate this in my network or whatever else, right? So especially the bigger the company, they oftentimes uh, rely on how richer levels of response or outsource more on those of those management activities as well. Uh, and yeah, for, for different reasons, again, often compliance reasons, because they don't not allowed to do this in certain instances. Again, favorite example, power plants. You can't just plug in another computer in a power plant and connect it to a network. You actually need to have this done by the, generally by the power plant uh, uh, constru construction, you know, like company, I don't know, General Electric or Siemens or whoever does it. So it's actually not as easy. But um, talking about help desk responsiveness, is um, you want to have responsiveness based on the severity level of the issue that you're having. This needs to be done now, now, now. It's very important for us to earn money. It's not an outage. It's just we need to have something done that's super quickly. What's your maximum response time? Same there, right? What's medium, what's low level? And bear in mind, you want to know about the stratification because it costs you. Right? Service level costs generally cost you money uh, um, on that level. And then, of course, we talk about um, availability. And availability is an interesting one because um, uh, you on the one hand, I mean, you saw the uptime uh, aspects already, 99.99%, right? Sounds pretty cool. But across what? A day, a week, a year, a decade, right? So it makes a huge difference if you think about it already, right? So because suddenly uh, what, what seems like super generous on a daily basis may not be as interesting if you only, you know, that it can occur across, a, as average across a month, if you like. So it's also something worthwhile uh, bearing in mind. We get back to this and how it's actually done in practice um, in a bit. So if you read um, contracts, this is more like for reference for you or best. I mean, if you, you now take something away if you want or can, um, but I just wanted to show you some hints to tricks that oftentimes embedded in those serverless level agreements. Um, so generally we, we have covered them, some of the baselines. There were obligations and authority. So obligations basically means kind of core principles of legal writing actually. Um, and the idea is there, who's responsible for what? Who cool, sounds good? Authority, who is the person in charge of what, right? But there's the other ones, the boundary ones. And that's the conditions and the limitations. And they often read a bit like that. Given that indicates a certain condition within which something holds. If you don't meet this condition, all that falls through, right? And at the end, there's always about limitations, something like unless. Right, so I'm not sure what the uh, uh, corresponding Norwegian word would be there, but you get the sense, I guess, uh, from reading contracts. So mind you, like it's in the, it's hidden in the language, and that's not, of course, it's an example of a term that could be used, right? But be mindful of conditions and limitations. They are often at the beginning, the end of the document, or only at the end of the document, or you know, generally not in the appendix. That would be just mean. I don't think it would even be legal. But um, so those are the tricky ones. This one is usually clear and crisp, but the exceptions will get you. So uh, bear in mind, that applies to pretty much any contract in your life, actually, but service agreements, uh, nonetheless. So just that pointer. Um, okay, I talked about this uh, review cycles, so let's I just leave it here. No disappearance. This is a good one. Liquidation terms. So how long? And that's, that's actually one of the challenges where people, uh, where people don't think about the beginning when they sign up one is, um, you know, what's the notice? Right. For employment contracts, you know, there's a legal 
limitations, right? How long a notice needs to be, right? Two weeks, four weeks, whatever, right? So if you reform, receive from your employer, but what about the SLAs, right? Two days, right? <laughs> you may actually be in trouble if your service provider shuts you down in two days, right? So especially if you host everything in Google Cloud or AWS or Azure or elsewhere, right? So uh, it will be very important to think about as well, what are the notice uh, periods and notice terms that the, uh, any one-sided uh, cancellation of that agreement would bring about? Right, so that because it says something about power. If you're growing your startup and you're in, you know incrementally growing it over time on a particular provider on a basis, you are suddenly uh, subject to that you know provider if the liquidation uh, so yeah the liquidation terms would be really uh, disproportionately low, right? So if they would say you know we quit in a week and so on, unless we hike up the prices by a factor two, guess what? We're probably going to pay that um, because uh, you can't afford this, right? So. Something to bear in mind should also be in there. What are liquidation terms? They usually cross pie across the provider, um, but yeah, relevant. Many of the points I make here is, of course, you will not find a response for this in the AWS uh, or Google terms, right? Because they are made for the long haul to some extent, and they're not for one-to-one -one agreements. But it's also bear in mind if you are in a position to actually buy or procure API services from a third party, for example, subscribing to it. Then it becomes more relevant of what you know what your use cases are what rate limits you get for example uh, and so on so numbers it needs to be kind of concrete and quantified where possible not in all instances does this work but uh, you want to be um, aware of this um, of course all providers have their service level agreement i just want to motivate a bit how this looks not not going through no worries there <laughs> uh, that's really not the purpose of this activity but uh, just to sense give you a bit of a sense of um, how those are structured um, or what you want to expect. So AWS service level agreement, there you go, okay, so there. Uh, they're actually literally done per service. And that's not a few, that's actually a lot, right? So every service has basically their service level agreement. So you will need to actually quite diligently look into all the services that you actually concerned with, that you possibly use. Uh, and see what the serverless level agreements actually are. And you better know about those before you're building your business and your production system on it, right? So it's quite a bit, right? So it's slightly more than five, I think. So um, you better be um, somewhat aware of it. Um, but let's take one that I would feel reasonably. Classic is, of course, EC2. That's their compute instances. Um, let's see. Let's support this one. EC2 service level agreement. So you get uh, the usual stuff. What does the effect? Usually, again, multiple service possibly. And then you have the same as you just saw for Google before, right? So interestingly, um, they actually give you uh, 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 the, the service credit is higher than with Google. They only give you 25%, but the rest is roughly the same. Um, and then a lot of definitions, you know, how things apply, what an availability zone is, uh, hourly uptime percentages, monthly uptime percentages, and so on. What is unavailable? What does it mean, right? No external connectivity. So it's very important to be clear what those definitions mean, usually in the definition section somewhere in a way. This is actually very, very clean uh, in terms of an SLA, and it's, that's, that's painless to read, I guess. Um, but you need to be in mind, you need to do for all services that you actually use, right? So um, yeah. same for Google. Let's see if I can just motivate this. I think Google is slightly more. Um, They're structured in a yeah, it's more uh, categorized, I guess. So quite similar in a way, but they have uh, more cost grain categories. For example, there, where's the compute engine? It's the app engine. Let's go with that one. So uh, similar, right? So quite lean, quite straightforward. Um, but the clustering is a bit broader, I guess. So um, yeah, so that's the idea. So in the define um, all the terms, kind of kind of sensitively. Bear in mind, bear in mind when you when you're thinking about this. Okay, um, talking about metrics, um, what's the most interesting metric that we're usually confronted with? When you think cloud service, what's the metric you're always thinking about? Always, a bit of a stretch, I guess, but let's say a, a metric you're thinking about. Hmm? Price. price is good. Yep, cool. Yes, price is good. 
You run it. You you bet me to that one. Yes, true. Yeah. Price. Okay. What's another metric? Second most important metric. Latency, you bet me to it as well, bad luck, okay, I was guessing wrong. Latency, yes, sure, important. This is also one of the metrics. But what, what if you think about like what, what's often uh, hyped, uh, like in terms of, you know, uh, service quality, marketing wise? Perhaps nowadays less than before. And passing throughput is there, yeah. So. Well, it's often uptime, right? So this whole, uh, you know, question how many, uh, you know, what, what's the availability you can offer? Uh, based on your system, because you're relying on third party, and companies ask the question first: Okay, how, how to what extent can you guarantee, irrespective of latency uptime, uh, latency uh, capacity, throughput, and all this, which is important, no doubt. But uh, um, uh, how can you guarantee that actually my service, my service running on your system, is available? Right, because that's the main point. Slow, yeah, probably get away with this, but not available, uh, no. So it would be B minus in equivalent of you know, marks that we would expect. I think it would be more like F, but you get the gist there. So it's it's an incredibly relevant, uh, important metric that um, is uh, good from a marketing perspective. So how much uptime do you need? How many nines to say do you need? Right? Because always it's a 99.99, So how much do you, should you get and need? What's what's good? What's bad? Yeah, please. Four, four, four nines. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Any other offers? I mean, that's not the right answer per se. What I want to motivate is what it, the implications are. So four nines, that's a strong one. Cool. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Three nines. Three nines, cool. Okay. Yeah. Anyone wants to have less? It's actually not easy to get three nines. So you pay quite a lot for this. I mean, if you, I'm thinking about the nines after the December place, you know? <laughs> not, not the ones before. Or do you oh, think? Yeah, huh? I was thinking about this before. As well. Oh, okay, 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 cool. It works, works. Yeah. Works so 99.99, cool, and that would be 99.9, right? So, cool, yep. What else? Anyone else? My proxy student there, no? One, nine, oh, nine, nine percent, that would be pretty full. I don't know, if I run that server, I want to have it for free, that's for sure. Depends on what you need. Okay, yeah, that's true, that's something that's true. We get that. One, yeah, that's one, one is offered, depends on what you need, is the response very good, and one is scary. I mean, if you mean 99.9, .9, like three, that would be cool. 9%, whew, I don't know. Um, tricky. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, let's let's look at this a bit. Um, like also from a, from a from motivation point of view. Well, you know, just if you do the maths a bit, uh, uh, it's about, you know, making, yeah, basically figuring out what it actually means on your basis. So having a basically 99% uh, availability uh, means daily, possibly 14 minutes offline. Eh? So that's actually quite, a, well, if you think about 99%, you would think intuitively that's a very high number and I'm pretty much always available, but 14 minutes over a day is 40 minutes, right? So that's something to, to bear in mind. What does that yearly mean if you break it down to some extent? It means three days off, right? right? So, um, so that was without any additional nine, it was two nines basically. Well, you get the gist that one nine probably wouldn't cut it. But um, so how does it happen if we, if we look at 90.99, that was three nines? Getting a bit better, right? So one minute daily. So can you afford it? Question mark. That's open open question, right? And but for, per year would still mean some you know eight hours offline. So you know it's like a, yeah a good solid work uh, day I guess uh, of offline. When you can afford this, that's that's okay, right? So weekly ten minutes and so on. Um, so just to motivate this further, so let's do the four nines thing. So it becomes now it becomes interesting, right? So daily eight seconds offline right on average so that's something i can that sounds territory where we can talk more or less about permanent availability right because eight, eight seconds means pressing yeah the f5 key twice i guess like like if i don't know how, how um frantic people do frantically people do this nowadays but this would be probably uh, uh, more than a territory so yearly and those is in fact the first service level that uh, at least Amazon and google as far as i recall right now uh, provide out of the box so that's that's something we get in, in, in the compute services uh, gener uh, generally. So you have a pretty good availability. The only challenge is, what do you think? What uh, what uptime guarantees do they do? What's the unit? Like you know, over what? Daily, monthly, weekly, yearly, two yearly? Lifetime. Sorry. Lifetime. Lifetime. That'd be good. Lifetime of their service or your service. 
<laughs> that would be convenient. Uh, no, it's in fact monthly. So they are always calculated uptime monthly. So that's why you should always look at that number, right? Because in worst case, it may just be you have four minutes off today, right? So that's 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 you always look at the worst case metrics, not at the best case, not some you know sort of sort of average there. But uh, you want to have uh, a clear eye on what what it means for you in worst case on a, on a day metric basis. Per month, exactly was mentioned here as well. Yeah, they they all do the same. Thing. And that's generally the service level you want to deal with. If you're talking uh, anything more than this, it becomes just ridiculously expensive. Uh, you know, like you daily have like less than one second and per year five minutes. Um, and of course, there is, there is a bit of a difference here, um, but uh, you would pay dearly for this one. Uh, so let's see. Precious nine, so it'll be six nines, daily 0 0.1 seconds. So per year, you would have a minute of downtime. That's pretty cool. but. That's next to unaffordable, right? Because the level of redundancy which you build up is uh, is beyond what AWS uh, and Google generally provide in the first place. Uh, but uh, I, you can approach them if you need. But you need to be, you know, have the have the right kind of uh, pool, I guess, to kind of make this happen. So uh, it's important to think about the, the the uptime you can afford and to think about it in terms of months. That's the key thing, right? Don't look at the day value. It sounds attractive. It sounds, you know, it's impressive and statistically kind of helpful a bit, but the monthly is the one that you need to uh, break down and kind of consider your worst case metric for a day uh, metric, right? Only if it's longer offline than four minutes do you get actually some sort of credit, right? But if your service is offline for four minutes now, bad luck, nothing's happening, right? So if they don't repeat it again over the next month, monthly cycle. So that's the idea um, there. So come limits, um, AWS, this is compute service. So the availability is calculated per service, right? So Cloud Functions has different availability than compute instance possible. But I always look at the compute instance because they are like the main, uh, uh, you know, the, the cash cow, if you like, right? So that's where the main magic happens, uh, running instances there. And usually the stable service as well. So 99.99 is for Google and AWS. So both have like four minutes per month that they can be a bit funky, but it's pretty good. Microsoft is actually, you know, 1995, actually 22 minutes. Right? That's quite some time, right? So they're not as, uh, it's hard to tie them down quite a bit more. So, but again, it varies massively over time based on the service maturity. If they have to do something, it's better, machine learning kits and so on. Yeah, whatever. I mean, then they explicitly say, you know, don't expect too much. It's completely better. They make it very clear often. Uh, but also popularity, and it's very clear that you want to use look at the availability also when you decide what whether you go, for example, for a container service over a VM where you host your own container in within right if availability is super important now nah, do it yourself, I mean it's not a pain anymore anyway, but it would probably cost you more, right so there's this trade off the question is how much downtime can you actually afford okay so um, enough there, I think I give you a break. For many reasons talking about. Student health again. I'm committed, am I? Huh? So anyway, um, so um, 15 minutes, 20 past. So welcome back. <laughs> welcome back, anyone who's still there. Um, let's continue a bit. So. Yeah, mostly everyone is listening to see how it goes. Am I recording? I think I am. That's good. Okay. So, uh, what did we look at so far? I mean, yeah, we hopefully learned, or yeah, you saw a bit about uh, service level agreements. So, it's something that you want to be aware of whenever and wherever and whatever you use to some extent, especially in professional capacity as uh, relevant for your production systems. Um, where particular requirements were responsibilities, metrics, specificity, uh, responsiveness uh, characteristics and so on and we talk about this phenomenon of uptime and what it actually means in practice and why this is to some extent relevant and you know where you what you want to be aware of again mostly that it's really monthly assessed and that they're varying strata for this and they're all expressed in service level agreements so before you decide for a particular service have a look there as well because they are generally quite clearly stated also, good indication. If you have a service level agreement and you don't have a penalty associated with this, that means the services are likely not mature. That they don't want to take any risk and liability for this. So, um, yeah, be aware of this. So, question: How's uptime managed? How's uptime managed? Or measured rather? Yeah. 
There's a comment online. Hang on. Depends. It depends is always good. It's the academic answer. Right. Uh, it depends. That's right. Yeah, it depends. Exactly. It does. So what are models for measuring half time? Because that's important as well, right? So you want to know what One would say, come on, machine is online or not? I mean, it should be, how hard can it be, right? I know that every time, if I pass at five on the internet, then it's offline, please. Um, do they measure how many calls go through? Okay. Or not? Mm -hmm. When you press refresh, mm -hmm. how often does it not read your entry? Yeah. Or that's a good point. So one comment from, uh, from from class here. So is it, you know, if you have a request, how many of those requests, basically count the number of requests that go through to the end, to the service that you're providing or hosting in any case, or, or not? So that could be a sensible metric. Yep, sounds sounds good. But what's another uh, thought? Offline uh, internally or externally? Uh, well, they generally would uh, measure it from within their service, not not externally. So yeah, and well, there. Yeah, I mentioned it's, it's how many requests go through actually and, and our return, not the, yeah, also our return, but how it is measured is, is basically uh, the, the total amount of time you could say uh, and then how many minutes or, or the time it was offline, the service was offline. Right. Okay, right. So we have to bear in mind this is, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the point is basically getting average metric uh, of, uh, you know, responsiveness of the server over time or given time frame, right? Yeah, you you're somewhat onto it because you said time, or you reference the time frame idea, right? So it's not just uh, a spot check, but actually it needs to be somewhat represented in average, right, to some extent. Why is that relevant? Why, why is that, you know, how is it possible that some requests go through and some don't anyway? What, what could be other causes or reasons? Uh, even though the service Yep. Or, I mean, uh, many requests, maybe some internal server, there's a lot of things. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of things. So, I mean, it also bear in mind networking, right? So, I mean, uh, not necessarily our networks request pass, especially remotely. So, uh, then there, there needs to be the, the opportunity to uh, allow for resends, uh, even if you have, you know, TCP requests that don't, or in cases where the IP protocol doesn't reach its end, then it needs to have the re. Uh, sending of the request from the uh, uh, layer four side, so on TCP level and so on. So it can can take a bit more time than necessary in order to actually establish the linkages. Doesn't mean it's down. It just means it may have timed out. So um, so sometimes this uh, and that can't be assessed because if a package is lost based on the timeout, you will not explicitly see that per se. It's not saying oh it's timed out. It's more like your client side assesses that things have timed out because you didn't hear back on time. Uh, and it doesn't help that you hear back slightly after your timeout that's too late already even that is considered simply timeout so so that would be considered offline yeah so there's that the network element to it that you can in all instances uh, guarantee that it's really up there and that's that's the same rationale that's applied here as well so yeah something is that the network is kind of the weak link in the formula so it's not always about your service but actually about the connectivity in between that's taken into account the very features of uh, the network protocols we're using so um, so it all depends on the definition of uh, downtime. But what generally happens in practice, if you if you configure, some of you will have taken some operations courses, I don't know, and perhaps have, yeah, set up your own monitoring system. But what's generally do, uh, happening there is that you have a frequency uh, with which you accept, uh, accept, and there are certain transition uh, state transition characteristics uh, that are that generally taken into account, right? So if you, for example, um, um, have a um, so generally idea you have two states right one is up and one is down but then you also have unconfirmed up and unconfirmed down what does that mean is basically that uh, as in addition to uh, figuring out that for example a service who was considered status up does not res has not responded doesn't mean that the service considered down immediately but actually you will send a second request eventually to establish that right and this is the parameterization that is open so how many requests does it require to change a service state right if a service for example doesn't respond two times doesn't mean it's down or the two network points right or three times five times right one time and one time is very unlikely because it would mean that your service status constantly flipped or oftentimes flips very often and that's undesirable so uh, or unrealistic in any case so uh, more realistically is that um, that there you, you will see confirmation of a particular suspected state. So if your service um, has not, so second case, the service was up originally, then has not responded for one time, but then turns out to be up again, uh, then this unconfirmed down is basically rejected, right? So, so even though you have uh, not fulfilled one particular request, the service considered up again. 
And con conversely, if the service was up and was unconfirmed down, a second request to establish it down. So, um, and in, in several systems, that's done in different ways. What usually means also that the monitoring frequency is dynamic. So, if your service is up um, by default, right? Oftentimes, the service check for um, for availability is only done every few minutes, right? So it basically sends more or less a heartbeat, if you like, to the service to you know port 403, port 80, whatever, right, to that very endpoint that you're serving on anyway. So we're creating artificial load on your service because you want to actually establish if this thing is running. Because you could otherwise say, well, yeah, why what? I, I check every second, right? But, you know, you put actual load on your system, you even pay for it because you'll possibly also pay per request. For example, for cloud functions, you pay per request, right? So, so suddenly you're also paying for monitoring additionally. So it's actually expensive on two levels. Number one is the load that you put on the system. Uh, at the expense of bandwidth that go to other people, but also the actual requests that may, you may be charged for in the first place. So that's why the practice is to have a lower frequency of checks for confirmed state. So if a system is down, you check less whether it comes up again. If a system is up, you check less so if it's, uh, if it's, if, if, if it's going down. However, if you're in those unconfirmed states where you have a suspicion that a state changed, either something went, hang on, I got the first response from a system that hasn't been down for three months, then you probably check more often to see is that actually you know, something that signals a state change. So um, many monitoring solutions have basically a 511 setting. So we basically say, uh, check every five minutes for unconfirmed status, check two times in one minute intervals for, sorry, for confirmed status, check every five minutes for unconfirmed status, check every uh, twice in a minute uh, interval. You can configure those things, but that's often the practice. You want to get two signals that something is actually up. And to do that, you check them more frequently, it can be in a minute uh, or so. Minute is generally uh, yeah, a time frame that's chosen. So it's not per second or every 10 seconds. That's quite unusual, simply because of load concern. Also, you would pay for it again, right? So you not only pay, uh, you pay for it two times. Number one, the monitoring service will be more expensive. For example, basic monitoring in AWS is free. But what does a basic monitoring mean every five minutes? So you will know only status every five minutes. You want one minute, you pay for it, standard monitoring. So it's quite expensive. So you pay for the monitoring, but you also pay on the receiving side because your service is involved, right? So bear in mind, there's a multiplicative effect um, that is actually happening that's associated with the frequency. But it's important or relevant to think about this as well. What does down actually mean? An unconfirmed down is not down, it's still up formally, right? So Amazon will not accept that you claim the thing was down until they think they confirmed that it's actually down. So there's also this incongruence of, of, of service definition. So it's worthwhile to be uh, clear about this. And um, more so, um, of course, if you have a private arrangement one-to-one, -one, you know, what defines up and down. And basically, perhaps you even look into the monitoring systems they're using. They're, for example, using, uh, what is it, Isinga, Nagios, all those mainstream, mainstream ones in private, sec uh, private environment. Then those uh, can be highly configured towards it. Okay. So uh, yeah, monitoring frequency, you know, it affects the uptime itself because it, it bites into your availability to some extent and be costly and reliability is in a trade off with efficiency, right? So you test for reliability, you're sacrificing efficiency, you're on efficiency, you better don't do any monitoring because then you have the matching on throughput, but guess what? You don't know what's happening to your system, right? If it goes down. So there's, they are actually existing in conflict to some extent and trade off at least conflict is not the right term. Okay, so the other aspect that is more related, uh, uh, relevant here, and that's why I titled billing up there, um, is um, how you need to think about in terms of the commitments when you sign up for a service, um, you better want to know how you're going to be billed. Right, so you may recall this for mobile data, probably, I'm not sure is this still a thing, I think mobile data, what's the unit of billing for mobile data nowadays? What is it? For Telenor? I don't know. Like how many gigabytes? Yeah. Well, you know, what was what the minimum unit of billing that you are built? Like, you know, so like if you switch on mobile data right now, what do you charge for it? Are you charged per megabyte per second, per kilobyte? Well, you're per day? charged monthly and then you have quotas. You have like either one gigabyte or three gigabytes and then you recharge for that and if that runs out, you have to buy more. Right. Okay. Right. So, yeah, but you conceivably, I think in the earlier, I'm not sure if it's still a, a thing it was. Uh, so if you had not volume based packages, but actually uh, rather time based packages, right? So you would, uh, I'm not sure if that was a thing here, but uh, you, you would basically switch, you know, go online and basically charge per megabyte. That may also happening if you just request 10 kilobytes. 
because we just want to check the email, right? So we didn't bother too much about this thing. Nevertheless, smallest billable, but that's the thing, billable, billable unit. So let's go with that thing. So the smallest unit of payment in a way, you know, defines how much you actually pay, right? So uh, the other aspect here that I'm saying is, uh, or what I'm reflecting is um, that you want to think about what is the minimum amount you're going to be paying when you do anything, right? So you may have a very cheap EC2 EC, uh, instance that only costs you 100 bucks per month, but the point is if, you, if the unit of billing is one month, you pay 100 bucks even though you spun it up for 10 minutes, right? So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the aspect you want to bear in mind. It's again super service specific. Uh, but you want to uh, be, be clear about this um, as well. And uh, again, um, there are, uh, um, let's say I have this uh, link here. Hang on. The services, or in particular, I'm talking mostly about AWS and uh, Google right now. Um, they actually make a bit of a, how do you say, a bit of a, game is the wrong term here, but actually that's the main business model, I have the impression, to obscure the billing. Um, not to obscure with intent, but actually that's the business model of, you know, um, so they have limited interest giving you the optimal billing model, right? So it's on you to kind of figure out your uh, optimal billing. To some extent, they provide you some aid, but uh, not necessarily to a, to a fullest extent. But what they write here, um, this is, for example, the structure field descriptor for a, for a um, bill that you probably be getting, right? Account ID, name, resource you do. You use uh, unique identifiers of the resource. But here, unit of billing. Right. So that's the thing you want to keep an eye on. If you, for example, bill, is it for example, bill per hour, right? So meaning you use one minute of a service, you'll charge one hour worth of service time, right? And this varies again across all service, but in this unified uh, standard format. So it's also important to know what the billable unit is. And if you were to ask me, okay, so what is the billable unit? Well, it depends as well, because you there's not only one way of billing, you can actually customize it. Um, and that can be in your favor, of course, or it is in your favor. But I give you some examples. Amazon is probably the most famous player in, in, in doing this. I've done this for quite some time. And they have interesting models there, uh, if you liked. Um, and the idea is, okay, here's not just one, you know, EC2 instance, that's what you're going to pay, pay, but there's actually various ones. And uh, I just want to point to some of them. So there's, of course, the... Um, on the left part, for example, you find things like saving plans, uh, as they call it. So that would be long term commitments. If you know you're running a service of, you know, one or three year terms, so you can commit up to three years already, right? So you, you're actually saving a considerable amount of money, right? It's the predictability aspect to it. Um, then there's the second one is the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the scaling, so the way you can anticipate certain scaling levels based on past, uh, you know, uh, usage and so on. But the more, in, um, and you know, they, they give you a bit more magic to kind of figure those out. Cost Explorer can explore your past usage. But what I like the most is EC2 spot instances. That's a really interesting model. And the idea is there, if you have a non-constant need for processing power, and assuming you do data crunching, and you just will say, yeah, I want to have this thing processed, but I don't care. Sometime in the next 24 hours is good enough for me, meaning you're running data crunching, you're doing some data mining or, you know, uh, I don't know, like data analytics in the widest sense, but you don't really care when it's actually running. You can go for EC2 spot instances. They're pretty cool because they look at the cheapest possible unused capacity in the AWS data center and run it there. So you, you batch effectively your workload and you say what you're willing to pay. So it's basically like an auction, negative auction. Uh, and uh, whenever uh, the the, the uh, resource unit price by Amazon comes down to that level because there's lack of usage of units, then they go down dynamically with pricing levels, and they would assign those empty, those idling instances to your thing, to your activity, basically. A bit like mainframe uh, usage, as it was before, right? Where you all, I'm not sure if you heard the metaphor, right? So before we had cloud computing was basically, or well before that, we had mainframe, you would book time, like for, you know, Weather, weather simulations or you know those kind of things that you would use the next day or for scientific purposes and that's kind of the same thing you basically say hey run me this thing here batched but run it whenever you can so it's not about service availability or any of that it's just about computing power pure and then you have this option here and those can be incredibly cheap or next to free effectively that you say i want to run this thing right now uh, you know when it's the off time and uh, you can you could say the pricing level that you're comfortable with i want 50 instances or 500 at that price 
and Amazon figures out when it can offer exactly those 500 at that price based on idling capacity in data centers. You can get it wrong, meaning you don't get anything. If you go higher, slightly your price, you pretty much surf very quickly. You just don't know which, in which data center exactly, and you shouldn't bother anyway. Um, so kind of neat. That is really more like for uh, big data, AI, ML, ML operations, not so much for classic cloud services. I just want to show the flexibility that come with the IIS infrastructure as a service providers that they, you know, the kind of models they come up with as well. So it's not all about hosting stuff and services, but also just about number crunching sometimes. And that's very interesting uh, opportunities that you that you can uh, uh, find there. So it's good to be aware of this. I don't know if Google has the same thing, but it's very well known in, in Amazon uh, that they do those um, spot instances uh, quite nicely. So yeah, nice feature. Uh, but again, it boils down knowing how you build effectively, right? So um, again, I forgot, I think in AWS Lumber, which is like the functions equivalent to Google, you build, I think, by, per 1 million requests or something, or 100,000, I forgot one of those. So bear in mind, that is a really broad and long billing unit, meaning if you have 50 requests, you charge for a few uh, thousand, for, sorry, right? So um, there's also this opportunity to scale up in uh, some instances. Anyway, this really cost, don't cite me on any of this, but you need to look at that effectively. I'm just saying those are the parameters you want to watch. And that's where you want to know your usage of your system. So it's very important for you also to do monitoring. And those services generally offer this of your usage in the first place to optimize your billing, which you can do pretty much at runtime. Okay, so there's always this thing, okay, which one is best, which one is worse? Uh, it turns out this market is always in a, in a, in a, in a dynamic, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no real clean equilibrium that's stable, I realize, because every time I look into it, it seems to have changed again, hell. Um, so I drew basically the next best, uh, I drew on the next best website that has a reasonably updated comparison right now, because that will change in like five minutes, but uh, to give you a bit of an impression how they do this comparison, um, they're diverse set of websites there, so that's not necessarily the, the way to, the place to go and so on, but um, they generally source comparable instances or types of instances, think, uh, you know, machine um, uh, flavors in, in OpenStack, like M1 tiny, M2, M3, T1 tiny, those things, right? Medium size, uh, large. And that's of course slightly different here, but let's say the AWS instances, they have, uh, they, they, they actually inspire the uh, flavors in OpenStack as well. So you have certain configurations. So MG6, uh, M6G, for example, which is basically uh, having 60 gig of RAM, uh, uh, and, and yeah, and this, that, that particular configuration, I don't know what this is right now, but need to look it up, probably six core medium size uh, instances, then a comparable setup from, from Azure, from Microsoft, and from Google, right? So that's the kind of baseline they use. So there could be a general purpose one, one that's more compute focused, more processing, memory focused, where it's really about just memory. It's cool, right? I have 61 gig. What number? How do you get this? I don't know. That's just something you get in virtual environments. I mean, I'm not sure if anyone, anyway. Um, so, but the other ones have, uh, you know, perhaps there's a typo there anyway, but uh, uh, the other ones have 32. Um, uh, and then there's accelerated computing that uh, looks at, uh, I think that's, this is, I actually don't know. So anyway, um, so uh, stratified by, by certain categories there. And the idea is then how does the pricing look like? And the main point you want to get away with this, that really depends on your usage pattern and your specialization, what you're doing. If you're more into computing, um, uh, then it may actually be cheaper to stick to AWS in many instances as it stands. Uh, but if you look, uh, and that is like, like uh, basically on demand uh, pricing, like short term pricing, uh, like you mean, you need an instance now, you want to do something general. Uh, well, probably AWS seems to be your friend right now in terms of general purpose use, but also the optimization towards computing or memory. Whereas, uh, yeah, Google can actually compete, but, but Azure, for example, is a bit more expensive, but becomes more interesting when you think, look at uh, accelerated computing, apparently. So um, right now, whereas Google is completely out of the depth. I mean, if you look at memory optimized, super expensive. Well, that doesn't surprise me given the memory spec, but let's say um, um, uh, the same applies here for um, accelerated computing as well. So there's always a bit of a, of a trade off in this way, but if you shift the perspective, this is like the normal instances, right? When you spin them up. But if you think about the one year plan, you have a bit more of a long term commitment, then the situation shifts a bit. Then, you know, for example, uh, AWS and Microsoft are somewhat comparable in terms of the general purpose instances, the kind of whatever I need a VM, give me one uh, kind of approach, as opposed to more specialized need case, uh, use cases uh, where um, the, um, you know, Google actually seems to be cheaper than. So if you have um, those needs, that it drops incredibly. Uh, low in terms of price and surprising and the the margins are massive 
like there's a massive shift it's not just you know like the previous one was uh yeah whatever i mean like you know 0 0.154 0 0.196 cool granted whatever i don't know like i don't know which api do i know better i go with that one doesn't hurt but this one is significant right if you're talking here 12 cents opposed to uh two cents that's um quite a, quite a different when it comes to the particular need that you actually have so um worthwhile keeping this in mind and the, the point is it's not about memorizing anything also it's not about the general patterns it's about realizing that there can be massive differences in price like massive differences in pricing for the particular service the main three big players so it always boils down to figuring out what's your use case and actually seeing you know what's the best offer you can get on the one hand number two look at the time frame is it good to commit to three years already at that price right uh, or is it better to just go with spot instances have the flexibility basically there right so those are the trade-offs that um, you commonly favor there are of course other factors fa uh, coming in for example operating system licenses generally you're supposed to bring them yourself uh you know and add them basically they inject it at, uh, at, at, at during instantiation it can also be added later um the uh yeah that's just the other dimension of course that uh, you want to think about so okay so thinking about uh for me economics so kind of wrapping this up um this letter bit moving away from the sl perspective was really more uh, to look towards the um high level strategic perspective how do you actually you know set up your entire system what what kind of uh, instances do you buy what services do you use based on the slas of course but there's no pricing availability maturity of services and of course what you what you want and the idea is there really to move away uh, from the thinking in terms of computers or instances in terms of machines but in instances in terms of uh, resource composition right so we talk about vms more generally talk about containers the function level virtualization which granularity suits you right so um that's that's essentially what all those services offers offer you kind of this this flexible re um combination flexibility spinning up things down having non-persistence in, in in containers for example uh automating configuration service configuration management big deal right you spin up new instance you better have the right config not just start typing you know uh, doing things manually in there so it needs to be automated to some extent um and uh, containerization where, where where useful because it allows you easily switching services and you know suddenly you know combining services using docker compose as we saw but perhaps also in uh, in, in, in um, more complex settings such as kubernetes and so on or um, docker swarm environments and so on and uh, the offerings are across available across the different providers uh, aws calls them uh, elastic beanstalk we have the container registry which is kind of the image docker hub private docker hub more or less the same we have in uh, google yes google has also i think it's called image registry as well i think i think it's called image registry i'm not, I'm not sure right now same principle you upload basically your uh, images there and can make them available um country, uh, you know um enterprise wide in a sense so it's about the decomposition and the the main point is um you know thing about scalability there um one thing um, think about your service no longer as instances. What I mean with this is actually, if you um, need have, have changed needs at runtime in terms of um, performance requirements, number of requests, and so on, how do you best scale up? Do you want a large number of small instances subject to pricing, but also the typical service that you run would be called horizontal scalability. So I have very small instances, but a lot of them, and rather spin them up and down where needed. Right? So this is good for highly volatile environments, so where you expect massive changes in peak usage and very low, you know, uh, uh, moderate case usage, or do you go for virtual scalability? Virtual scalability has generally the advantage that it's um, uh, if you so if you have a more moderate volatility, of course, that you have higher responsiveness because horizontal scalability means you spin up and down instances more often. That takes time. Latency goes down. Right? So it takes you a bit. I mean, with Docker, we talk about this being quick and fast and agile and, you know, being quick to boot up. No, never less you saw me doing this. That takes a bit as well, right? So talking about seconds generally um, that we're spinning up things. And in terms of responsiveness, that's not optimal. So if you need a stable uh, uh, fixed latency, but experience generally limited uh, latency variability, then virtual scalability, meaning larger instances may be better. More cores, more RAM, more disk, right? supposed to be more often. Um, but the thing that you want to think about this, again, coming back to resource thinking, that's what I frame you here, you want to think in terms of statelessness as well, it becomes very important to be aware that the database should probably not be hosted in them, but actually completely be separated as well, to make this flexible, right? So not to require persistence or extensive configuration, 
um, and avoid sessions as well, right? Because sessions bind instances. So if you start a session or interaction, basically, um, uh, assuming you're doing load balancing, I'm briefly motivated a few weeks ago, the idea of load balancing that you equally distribute, for example, requests across multiple instances. Get an IP endpoint, checks in a round robin fashion or availability fashion, is instance one or two available, uh, you know, or seeks equal distribution and then distributes the request. The problem is you have sessions, you have kind of a session linking basically, right? So that um, um, the, the, the load balancer generally recognizes, oh, hang on, there was an initiation of an HTTP session. Now I will redirect any request to that same service again, basically response to the response by the service, a new request effectively, uh, uh, to the very same instance. So irrespective of load. So, you know, if you get it wrong and you have long running sessions and uh, a disproportionate number of those ones are linked to one node, you lose this load balancing effect as well. So working without um, sessions as much as possible, doesn't always work, payments, can't do it on. Um, but in some other instances it would be, um, is of course desirable here as well. So something to bear in mind when we think about resources, decomposing the idea of fixed, you know, uh, computational units, if that makes sense. So sticky sessions is the key word here um yeah so that's that's the, that's the one aspect in terms of the flexibility the other thing is now big picture again going macro um is to think about the uh entire setup that you have so it's no longer about oh i have this instance i have this service but actually composition of the entire service you know i'm there's some glimpse of this of course expressed in docker compose which is you know very minuscule you know you spin up a few databases and then web front and perhaps the mail service and fun colors and so on no 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 this is bigger picture uh, this is really where you think about your entire infrastructure uh, as it's laid out, right? On the one hand, you have, of course, need to deal with things like, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 you know privacy, of course. We haven't talked about this, uh, uh, unfortunately, which is a pity. But also infrastructure uh, that you, you want to um, think about in terms of your asset of your company. If you don't have infrastructure in your house anymore, right, because you rented it or, yeah, rented it effectively with AWS or Google, you need to find a way of kind of, you know, codifying this infrastructure, right? And I'm not talking about five computers or uniform computers, but I'm talking about architecture. And uh, I just want to point you to um, AWS's approach, which is kind of, kind of a neat direction. And um, of course, I will not make any strong point that um, that we, we're going to do that. But um, hang on, let me just show you something. Um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that is the idea of uh, having um, infrastructure reference layouts. So the idea is there, AWS allows you to basically encode your entire architecture of your entire system, right, based on different patterns, they can even be public, to show how different services are basically interlinked. You get a blueprint of your entire data center at the button press, basically your context file that spins up all those instances. For example, here's like a document understanding solution. So they have those reference, those blueprints, if you liked, uh, for, for which you can do those. Um, let's see, and when you get the main page is basically best practice for HPC and it basically allows you, so hang on, um, to see So basically to, to look for reference implementations more or less, different blueprints um, for, for your uh, you know for your configuration in its entirety. The, the point here is really to motivate that it's no longer about uh, you know having uh, your individual instances but actually thinking about this whole system holistically. I have a, perhaps that's a better one here. your tab gets me sometimes so uh, for example uh, having reference infrastructure here's the idea that we have asynchronous online gaming so if you're uh, developing a game for example want to host this one well you know how does it actually work right so you have a notion of for example players that interact with your system via an internet gateway then there's uh, amazon route 50 c you see a dns server interacting with this and kind of frames this entire session because it says what are the domain names what are the host names that are embedded in there how does the redirect work and so on that's done by this one then we have load balancing that differentiate between uh, two sets of web servers um, that are actually grouped basically and they are respectively um, uh, 
uh, you know, the requests are redirected to those ones, then you have another, I guess, load balancer that actually redirects any requests to application servers that do the business logic, whatever coordination a game actually does, right? The one is front end, the other one is more towards back end, which itself uh, relies on uh, um, yeah, high responsive, um, highly responsive database in the first place, caching primarily using Redis. And they, again, are then backed by databases for long-term storage and persistence. So, um, so the idea is basically having those reference infrastructures templating, they call it cloud formation as a, uh, as a concept, uh, is basically represented as a large JSON file that calls all the services with all the configurations, and you literally can start that configuration, and it spins up this entire uh, you know, infrastructure, if you like. So um, the point here being, it's no longer just important to think about individual services, but also about this entire configuration, because suddenly your data, your data center is a JSON file, more or less, and that's an asset. Of your company, but it also has a, in, a the downside. This stuff is not standardized. So if you're sticking to AWS and you want to switch to Azure or Google, they will have their own solutions um, that won't necessarily be easily possible, right? Because it would require a mapping of all the different services, which are all named and uh, are by nature quite different there, but also have different parameterization and so on. So you lose again. You have this lock in effect, but nevertheless, it's important to think about this from this big picture perspective uh, as well, and look at providers that offer you this. To some extent, because in the end, it's about you. It's quite quite, uh, quite funny if you look actually at some of those things that tell you how long it takes to spin up those things. So it's written there. It's like oh, 25 minutes. Oh, but you know, it's not as a, it's not immediately. Nevertheless, takes time. But if you think your data center is going down or you lose information, you lose data. How long does it take you to get your company back up and working, right? And suddenly, those guarantees matter, right? Because is it worthwhile mucking around until we get our system working again, or do we just uh, pull it back out of the data? Reinstantiate the entire thing in 30 minutes and then, you know, uh, um, uh, take the latest state of the data we have, right? This is one of the ways you can uh, possibly do it. Um, so that becomes clearly strategic at that stage. There's no longer just uh, feeling about, you know, thinking about what's the best programming language and what do they support, but actually about what they actually, um, how you can quickly deal with um, um, yeah, issues, right? So of that nature. There's also Rich said, it turns out the um, community has shaped around this idea. There's a rich set of samples. Um, I'll provide you with the slides anyway that you can browse in, on GitHub um, because you can share those setups as well. That has become a bit of a community thing. So, best practices in terms of, um, um, you know, for, for different purposes, reference uh, implementations, architectures for IoT, for example, seems to be fairly active. active. Um, EKS, that's right, uh, linkage, QLDB, forecast something. So um, there's quite a bit of those reference architectures people put out, and that can also be extractive, particularly from a researcher perspective when you want to make uh, uh, talk about your, your infrastructure to some extent. Anyway, so this kind of is meant to conclude the perspective from the higher level, right? So we looked at the very narrow level, what do individual services offer? What's the expectations in terms of availability and the other metrics, best and service level agreements, but then also what does it mean for us as a company having tied down the service provider with respect to this? What does it mean from a robustness perspective can actually spin up stuff again if things go uh, uh, down or uh, work unexpectedly wrong? Here's an example. Estimated, there's a document understanding example. So it's basically just document interpretation heaps of ML facility change uh, um, uh, after each other. It says estimated deployment size 30 to 60 minutes, right? So it gives you a sense of what you're dealing with here. So it's not just, you know, uh, five seconds, everything is up. You actually have a series set up behind you. But this is the strategic side and, um, you know, documenting this in this way to some extent, but also being able to directly instantiate it from the documentation is kind of cool in one way, but it's also very important. It becomes part of your assets as a business. Um, so uh, talking about economics and uh, compliance on the other hand. So uh, NS file is, of course, relevant from a uh, perspective of cloud technologies. OK, so a lot of words. A lot of words. Don't forget any of them. Oh, that's side. But, um, um, so, but this com completes basically the cloud computing picture in many respects, right? So um, we have talked in the, in, the, in the earlier session, or one, one of the things that we're talking about is like, we think about cloud computing, this is the definition by NIST, by the way, but, you know, uh, it, it covers many of the aspects that we uh, kind of have thought about, like the on-demand, the self-service idea, the automated uh, automation principle that uh, come with cloud computing, network access, uh, flexibility being by pooling resources, or the elasticity, elasticity, I briefly referenced scalability, different forms, 
vertical and horizontal. Should memorize those ones useful also for the exam hint. Um, and now it's forgotten. And uh, uh, billing, right? The other one, right? So dealing with the actual billing. I mean, monitoring is super essential. If you have a cloud service that hosts stuff but doesn't do monitoring, don't do it. At least not for production systems. It's fine for you know for our uh, you know course activities and so on. That's of course no no brainer. But from production side, you definitely want to have solid monitoring, right? Um, that's very important. The other aspect that comes with this and hinges on it is billing. I right? talk about units of billing, uh, what is billed, what is uh, penalties associated with this that's uh, described in SLAs, and who is responsible uh, for what. And of course, you being able to customize billing as well, because your needs in a company may change. If you are with a provider that always has a fixed price for a cloud you know, instance VM and you have 50 of them, probably maybe cheaper to thinking migrating to Google AWS or Azure or amongst those uh, where needed. So there's always this flexibility um, um, suggestion when it comes to it. So it's not hard and fast. There's always a bit of movement in the market. Okay, so that was quite a bit of information, admittedly, uh, about this, but I felt it was important to, to bring this, to get this out as well, uh, because that's the kind of dimension we don't look at it, technologists usually. I don't really care about it. Um, but this ultimately, and I'm not, I'm not, that's not an advocacy statement here, but oftentimes that defines what we do on a technological side, right? So cost, flexibilities, preferences you, you don't quite know but sometimes it's good to know at least what are the strategic pointers you want to think about also when you look at the next sla hopefully you know what to look for and or you know pointer hard metrics conditions limitations that's where you get you uh and yeah again bring it down to to hard specific metrics that really apply to you no units units of measurement especially for averages uh very important in cloud tech. okay i'll leave it this for today um yeah, we don't have enough time. That's good enough anyway. Um, questions, comments, perhaps from anyone? I know, you know, um, it was quite a bit of intake, but perhaps someone has some practical experience they want to share or intuitions or additions or comments. If not, then we're meeting next. Uh, feel free to post uh, while I'm talking. Um, we're meeting on Wednesday, and then everyone has their five minutes. Oh, please. Can you post an overview of the concepts and stuff you've come over on things like this for the exam and stuff, like the curriculum? Uh, yeah, you mean like a review for the exam? Is that what you're looking for? Or what do you mean? Uh, More like a list of like this is the different concepts that will be. Yeah, of course. Exam. Yeah, I haven't, that is definitely not a review lecture. There's still more active content. I took the opportunity to say, cool, it's still the last week of lecture. I can inject some knowledge. Uh, yeah, no, no, of course, of course. I provide you a, uh, an overview of all the different areas that I think we have sensibly talked about. Um, I will not ask you about which button to press in Google Cloud Compute, or should I? Anyway, uh, to, to do the following, but you know, the general big picture concept. And here's the thing, there haven't been many. I mean, like you have spent most of the time actually coding and uh, doing things anyway. Um, this course has been condensed in that respect quite a bit, uh, but uh, yes, there are. So I'll definitely, you will get a review overview uh, of the key concepts um, that, that come out and you can ask questions about them as well. Um, please, so, definitely. So the uh, written exam or the uh, yep. online exam is going to be more uh, testing or uh, knowledge of the concepts rather than the coding part? Yes. And the reason is mostly that. I mean, um, when, when you think about courses, I think about the component uh, K plus S. K is knowledge, S is skill. Skill, I think you got quite a bit of this, right? So, I mean, you spend a lot of time in code base anymore. If you still didn't figure out what go, how coding does certain things, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't, but that's probably not the role of the assignment to figure that, uh, the, the exam to figure it out. So I will go more for concepts because it's also important that you kind of, you know, have an attitude. Even if you don't do cloud computing, concepts are stuff you'd want to take away from it, right? But if you do it, of course, you need to have both in a way, right? Um, but we also, you know, there's this academic side and the university side. I need to ask you some, some of conceptual things that you want to take beyond the pure code base that you have worked on. Yes, it will be more on the conceptual side. However, I try to sneak in some cases or something that you actually need to uh, have an opportunity to kind of put your uh, um, you know thoughts to it as well um, because the exam will be a home exam and i know what that means i know that you know in contrast to you uh, to me you guys have two screens there and one is connected to your laptop which you do your exam on the other one is connected to your desktop which you don't do your exam on but luckily you are able to type with both hands at the same time now jokes aside what i mean is the, I can't, I can't control your exam environment anyway, so the fact the exam is more or less an open book one, I guess.
guess, right? I don't know. I don't see myself in a position to 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 cover this. Please. I I, I don't know if because uh, the way I understood this, this isn't it cannot be like a multiple choice exam. It's a mix. I will do both. So multiple choice, of course, uh, is pretty defeated by open book exams, yeah. uh, sense. Um, and I had traditionally done this more, um, but uh, we, we need to mix this a bit uh, up there. The exam is scheduled for three hours, but I don't think you will need more than an hour. So I, I yes, exactly. Um, so the exam is generally not terribly long. It has never been. Uh, I, I mean, I will not make guarantees it's formally three hours, my ex but it shouldn't be your expectation to spend your lifetime there. Um, yeah, can you post a schedule for presentations? I can do that. It would be exactly the one, the project groups that are listed out. I'm going in exactly that order. Um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I can, I can re-emphasize this. So, yeah, so that's my experience. I, I, I don't know. I mean, if you want, we can make a try of ours, sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> who's excited, who's not, right? Um, but, you know, it's only so much, unless I get you programming again, and I don't want to assess you in external programming again. That's just not, uh, doesn't make sense anymore. So it shouldn't be terribly painful. Uh, you know, on the other hand, the, the exam can't sway too much anyway, because the bulk of the marks are actually on the internal. So, what, you know, there's not much to, to get, you know, unless you have a two marks deviation that wouldn't affect your final mark anyway. So your interns are a very good predictor of your final outcomes. So, please. so when will we get the feedback? Yeah, that's right. It's my question as well. Uh, <laughs> to myself, I know. Uh, not through yet, sorry. Um, yeah, we need to um, get this going. Um, but uh, you get it well before that. Um, the exam is on 10th, right? May or June? June. Good. Um, lucky you, or lucky me, because otherwise I would have uh, submitted the exam already two days ago. That's good. So, uh, so yes, how lucky to still a bit of uh, uh, time there. But yes, um, that's our next uh, our thing to do. In addition to the other courses that we have as well, we have similar challenges. It's always the May May phenomenon. But yeah, we get to it. So provide you to the bucket melding. I haven't had it. Don't have it handy yet. Sorry for that. Um, other spurs mal got malene maler. Oh yeah, that thing. Question. Um, if you have other comments, question. You can also post them, or we can also answer them on uh, Umstag Wednesday. If you have some as well. I think we need to keep a bit on be a bit on our toes on Wednesday because uh, usually my colleague kicks me out at twelve fifteen. I guess I tell him he should hold his lecture online only. Um, yeah, so we need to see if we get the timing right on Wednesday when it's about the presentation. Please, do you have a comment? Uh, I was just uh, like uh, about the uh, the uh, order which we're going to present. So that's uh, project groups. Group, uh, yeah. Exactly that one. I used the one that, the way. <laughs> Yes, I even come call out the numbers that haven't explicitly been referenced uh, in your interesting uh, group identification approach. Um, but yeah, in that order. So who comes, you know, who has been first note? It offers the greatest clarity, and we basically de facto have a good overview there. I encourage everyone before, ideally, the presentation to kind of highlight the key points of the template that are marked, right? Tech used principles. Because by then, you should have a reasonably clear grasp of what you want to deliver, right? If not, then when? <laughs> Uh, because there were still a few TBAs I saw, uh, it would be good to kind of be hard on this. Other than group names, I'm flexible on that one, if that helps. So, but that's it from my side. Um, yes, five o'clock. Hope you can have a good remaining day with a lot of cloud huh? development, of course. <laughs>